Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to two former editors of Marvel Comics, Roy the Boy Thomas and Danny Fingeroth. That would be cool enough, but they've teamed up on a very special new book, The Stan Lee Universe. Stick around. We're only here as long as Stan the Man deigns to allow it. One wrong word or questioning look from any of us, and he'll reduce us to a speck of dust in the neutral zone. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 900 archived celebrity and pop culture interviews for your listening pleasure. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of former Marvel Comics editors lounging around in their spidey underoos in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Every Marvel Comics fan knows the names Roy Thomas and Danny Fingeroth, curators of a new book, The Stan Lee Universe. Both have been editors at Marvel Comics during its long and storied history, and both have gone on to establish their credentials as comics industry's historian. And both will be joining us in a moment. Fingeroth, now a senior VP of Education at the Museum of Comic and Comic Art uh, in New York, was a guest on Mr. Media back in 2008, promoting his book, Disguised as Clark Kent, Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. As for Thomas, the editor of Alter Ego magazine, I interviewed him for my biography, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, at the behest of Stan Lee himself. Lee had told me about his exchanges with Eisner, two of which were quite eye-opening. In one, he literally solicited the creator of The Spirit and a well-respected publishing success himself to take the man's seat as publisher of Marvel Comics. Eisner declined. In the other, he vaguely recalled proposing a humor magazine and asked Eisner to flesh it out. Lee said to talk to Thomas for all the details, which I did. For most comics fans, those two little-told stories of the history of of the Marvel Comics universe were delightful what-if moments. Now Thomas and Fingeroth have come together on a new project, the Stan Lee Universe, <clears throat> excuse me, which collects rare memorabilia, letters, and interviews with one of the greatest creators and characters himself in the known universe. It's a really fun read, and I heartily recommend it to you. Roy Thomas, Danny Fingeroth, welcome to Mr. Media. Great to be here, Bob. We're glad to be here. I um, appreciate talking to you. It's always a thrill to even know that I can reach you guys. I, I appreciate that. I will that. forgive you for calling it the neutral zone. I think you meant the negative zone. Is that what I said? I'm sorry. The yeah. negative zone. That's all right. <laughs> Some, somewhere somebody must have used the uh, phrase neutral zone uh, in, in a Marvel comic. and uh, Probably uh, Stan. Yeah, probably Stan. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that he might have made a mistake, the great Stan Lee? No. Tell me it ain't so. I once referred to Spider-Man as Peter Palmer and, and let the word Superman go out for Spider-Man in an early issue. I, I think it could happen. <laughs> and you see, it's, it, it's your job, to, uh, Bob, to explain uh, why it's not a mistake, and you get your no prize. <laughs> I won't even try. Okay. I'll just I'll just accept the slap on the wrist and move on. <laughs> um, you know what I'd like to do to start is to hear from each of you about your first encounter with Stan. And I, I think uh, Roy, you go back a little further with him, so maybe we'll start with you. Well, of course, my first encounter was through the uh, the mail through a couple of letters, uh, not very many. I remember he sent me a, a a real early issue, like number six or something, whichever was the first one, with Sandman when I told him I had missed it on the stand somehow, and I was wondering if I could buy it. And he, I guess he knew me mainly through Alter Ego. First time he ever mentioned me was uh, in a letter in which uh, he uh, was responding to a review of the Fantastic Four that I wrote a couple of weeks after it came out in 1961. Is that one of the things that's in the book, Danny? That, that um, uh, is about the Alter Ego... What um, a letter to Jerry Bales. I think it might be in that letter. Uh, yeah, anyway. there's, there's early correspondence uh, with Stan and Jerry, and you yeah. and you have a recollection in there just of, of your uh, of your first meetings and, and working yeah. with Stan. Yeah, I, I basically uh, then I, I met him in 1965 because I came to New York to work for DC Comics as an assistant editor of Superman, and I wanted to meet Stan, and he wasn't interested in getting together for a, you know a beer or even a good bottle of wine, but he uh, 
invited me to pick up and take this Marvel writer's test that he'd been giving out through ads in the New York Times in various ways, looking for a writer. He hadn't found anybody quite uh, yet that he liked by means of it, but he asked me to take it, and I took a stab at it without ever meeting and just sort of surreptitiously picking it up at the office on my lunch hour and then handing it in the same way. And, uh, and then uh, he invited me to come over the day after I turned it in. He invited me to come over uh, to meet him on my lunch hour. It was on a, a Friday in July, early July of uh, 65. And about 10 or so minutes after we met, he just sort of turned and looked out at, uh, down on Madison Avenue and um, there being no good-looking women there at the moment to distract him, he said, so what do we have to do to hire you away from National, which is what they called you know, D.C. In, in those days. And I said, well, just, just offer me a job. I said, I'm not happy uh, there And uh, after this week or two. And uh, so by that afternoon, having been thrown out of D.C. by uh, editor Mort Weisner when I uh, gave him my notice at D.C., I was back at... Marvel and being given an issue of Modeling with Millie comics to uh, to dialogue over the weekend. So that was the the beginning of what became a you know 15 years at Marvel, followed by uh, most of another decade back in the uh, 90s and some little bit of work here and there since. Hmm. It's interesting uh, to me that um, uh, when I you know as I was growing up uh, and reading the comics in the starting in the mid to late 60s through the 70s. Um, to me, Marvel Comics was Stan Lee and Roy Thomas because your name was on everything that I remember seeing. So I, I'm really glad to hear that story. Um, and and Danny, uh, t- well, tell us where you come into this. When did you first m- make contact with well, Stan? Well, let me. Let me um, I, I, I want to answer that, but you know, I'm realizing, and I thank you for your compliments about the book. Um, but you know, what, what I find the interesting thing about this uh, the Stan Lee universe is it's one of those books where you sort of say what it is and people kind of get it and then they look at it and they go, oh, that's what this is. I've got to buy it. Um, so let me, let me just try to say a few words about what it is. It's, it's, it's rare interviews, um, articles about um, um, articles by, uh, lots of rare photos, a lot of stuff that we found at Stan's archives, which are oddly enough at the University of Wyoming in Laramie where they have a big American Heritage Center. And when you ask Stan, why are your archives at the University of uh, Wyoming? He says, uh, Jack Benny's are there, and if it's good enough for Jack Benny, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and as for, as for why Jack Benny's are there, you'd have to check with his people. But they have a large American, uh, heri- American pop culture um, uh, collection there. It's a very impressive place. kind of place that, say, if one of us or if one of your listeners was, you know, if they said, there's a quarantine, you can't leave for six months, you'd, we'd go, uh, okay. You know, throw me a sandwich once in a while. <laughs> so I so I found just many uh, rare um, artifacts from Stan's career, letters from celebrities like Mario Puzo and uh, uh, Sammy Khan, who was uh, who was famous as being Frank Sinatra's lyricist and uh, uh, and a partner in uh, various escapades. Um, le- you know, Roar had a lot of stuff in his own archives of letters from Jerry Bales. Um, there, there, I found actually correspondence from and to Will Eisner about uh, the uh, humor magazine that he was possibly going to do for Marvel that never came uh, to materialize. Uh, uh, there's a debate between Stan and a colleague of Frederick Wortham's that named Hilda, Dr. Hilda Mossy that was on the Barry Farber radio show in 1968. You know, somebody made an air check of it. It's in the archives. So it's all this rare stuff put together in a coffee table format book, interviews with many Stan's colleagues who unfortunately, uh, including, um, you know, Jerry Robinson, who just, uh, we just lost this week, but including many people who are no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, so, so, that, so, that, so I just want to be sure people have a sense of, it's kind of like the Stan Lee vault um, with... Uh, and it's kind of a, 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 a snapshots of popular culture history and Stan Lee and Marvel history across the decades. Um, that's to sort of make up for me not having as good an answer of Roy the first time <laughs> I met Stan, but I can't really remember the first time I met Stan. I came to Marvel at a time later than Roy uh, in the late 70s, and Stan was still in the office, and he was just like this blur you'd see run by, you know, or or... 
you know, the uh, or the office with the the aura emanating out of it. Um, and I started my first job was as uh, the assistant in the British department to the editor there, who was Larry Lieber, who Stan's brother, of course, and they still do the Spider-Man newspaper strip together. So Stan was just kind of this presence, and I can't, I cannot pinpoint the moment I met him. I also one of my favorite stories of working with him was on a Spider-Man annual in the 80s when I was uh, editing Spider-Man and uh, Stan was doing the script on once, the one where uh, J. Jonah Jameson gets married and they fight the Scorpion. Um, and I remember getting the script and I, and I had some questions about it and I thought, well, how am I going to approach uh, Stan Lee and, uh, and dare to ask him about uh, making changes in his script and, you know, I, I gathered up all my courage and I called him. And I, I, I knew Stan by that point. I mean, I certainly I'd met him and had, uh, had different uh, various dealings with him. And I remember he was the most professional writer I ever dealt with, you know. He said, tell me what your problems are. Um, if he agreed with them, he would make the changes. If he didn't agree, uh, he would argue his point. And uh, ultimately he said, you're the editor, so whatever you want is what we'll do. And it kind of blew my mind that, you know, where Stan could have just said, I'm too busy, uh, printed as it is, and leave me alone. He, you know, considered as if I was an actual peer, uh, my comments. So that's sort of one of my most memorable Stan moments. And uh, well, and let me let me let me come back to Roy with a similar type of question. Roy, uh, Stan's uh, way of writing, and I use the term a little light, loosely, a script for comic has been much talked about. There's some reference to it by some of the people who are interviewed in the book. Sometimes he would just throw an idea, a, a plot at, at an artist, and have them go lay it out, and then he'd come back and 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 uh, you know add in uh, dialogue and description. Um, what were some of your experiences? With, was it always the same working with him, or was it different depending on how much he had going on at the time, for example? Well, of course, I rarely wrote anything really with Stan. You know, he, he would edit my work in the early days and, and occasionally change words after that. But I will say that in terms of, and I think this is uh, could be you know verified with things in our, in our book and, and other things that have been printed, and that... Um, he he really worked with at, at one time or another in his career, and even during just say the Marvel phase that would begin, you know, from say sixty one on, almost every way that you can imagine, uh, except maybe a full script, you know. Uh, and he had written many many of those back in the you know the forties through the fifties, uh, but uh, he did everything from a rather detailed plot, uh, you know. I think some of the, the pages of Fantastic Four plots and a few other things we found are very full, and Larry Lieber says he wrote out a page or two, you know, and you can get everything you need for a story just about in a, in a page or two, except some of the exact details of running here and running there. Uh, everything from that to uh, a little conversation over the phone for five or ten or fifteen minutes to just telling somebody, well, why don't we use, uh, you know, have Dr. Doom be the villain, you know, and uh, uh, and, and so forth, and uh, you know, so, so, and, and running the gamut from you know all the way from one end of the spectrum to the other, there wasn't any one experience. So the different, even the same person at different times would be adding probably the same artist would be adding different degrees and different amounts of uh, of plotting uh, from you know from one time to the next. It is true though that while, as time wore on and he got had more and more other duties, administrative and so forth, uh, even while he while he was still just editor as opposed to being publisher. He did tend to, uh, you know, rely more and more on the artist to do the uh, the story. But of course, by that time, he was working only with a couple of people like, you know, what John Buscema, uh, Jack Kirby, uh, John Romita, uh, uh, two or three major artists who really uh, didn't need need much direction, and sometimes really didn't want that much direction. <laughs> Maybe John Romita would have liked a little more, but I think John Buscema was very happy to. Uh, to do it that way, and, and Jack probably uh, was too. When Stan did give him a plot, he had a tendency to change it a lot, so he, so maybe he was just happier doing it that way. Um, uh, you know, one thing one thing that we that we uh, you know we we, uh, we have interviews with uh, eight or ten of Stan's uh, artistic collaborators, and uh, I find um, the common thread is that they all say that no matter how they worked with Stan, he brought out the best in them. You know that that working with him. 
they did the best work of their careers. You know, so that I found that you know, and 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 the most enjoyable work, even if it was challenging, even if they had to do, you know, a certain amount of the plotting themselves or whatever. They, you know, their their the universal takeaway is, boy, that was really the best stuff I ever did, or among the best stuff I ever did. Was there anyone who? You know, I mean, this is a book that's a celebration of Stan, obviously. But were there people that uh, whose interviews, either that you you interviewed or whose older interviews you found that you know were not as favorable in terms of what they had to say about Stan? Well, as you say, it's a celebration. So um, I would I would say the the there's an interview of uh, Lee and Kirby. Um, tra- again, uh, I call it lost in quotations. I mean, uh, maybe. You know, I'd never seen it or heard of it. It's from 1967 on uh, WBAI radio in a local New York station. And um, I imagine it's probably on in the middle of the night. And then I found the air check of it. And I, I would say you can see uh, maybe cracks in the Stan and Jack relationship beginning to appear if you read between the lines in that interview. You know, so I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff we present there that. Um, um, if you were looking at it with a jaundice eye, you might, uh, you know, find um, an undertone from somebody. But certainly, our, our intention, um, in in and you know, in the book's intention is to celebrate Stan. Hmm. Um, what were some of the surprising things that you found in in going through the archives that maybe you hadn't seen before? And I'm and I'm guessing because both of you are, you know well-known as uh, comics historians, fans. Uh, uh, you know, Roy, you, you were doing Alter Ego before Marvel. You're doing it now. Very clear you guys have a pronounced interest. And we know that comics fans save everything. <laughs> we know that they have these memories like elephants. But w- were there things that you guys found that still surprised you? Roy, you want to uh, take that? Or? Well, yeah, there, there are... Uh there are always some uh, surprises. Uh, one of my uh, personal favorites was seeing for the first time in quite a few years. I think this must be something that uh, maybe I found it something that had been left when Jerry Bales had passed uh, the in, the uh, sort of the father of comic fandom and the instigator originally of Alter Ego back in 1961. Uh, a postcard from him uh, from Stan to to Jerry that said they had these several. Little features coming out in a in a couple of weeks in uh, the summer of '62. Uh, there was uh, Thor and uh, an Iron Man, and there was also going to be a Human Torch series, and that that caused me uh, a lot of problems because Jerry shared that postcard with me at the time. So I'm going around you know every week haunting the the uh, stores, uh, the new <laughs> store for uh, you know for, for comics with Thor and. Uh, uh, did I say Iron Man? I meant, I'm sorry, I meant to say Ant-Man. Thor and Ant-Man. Iron Man came along about half a year later. Um, and so I'm looking for him, including Ant-Man. Wondering what in the world is Ant-Man? And suddenly, I, I one day, I see, uh, it may or may not have been on sale the same week as uh, the Thor introduction, but uh, here's a comic with a guy called Spider-Man. And I said, well, Stan must have changed his bug, you know, that he decided the guy was going to be. And because uh, there's no Ant-Man here, but here's a Spider-Man. And it was only about a week or two later that suddenly Ant-Man came out. And I, I just realized at that stage, it, it, it underscored what a sort of throwaway character Spider-Man really was. That even at that time, Spider-Man must have been in the works when this postcard was written. Uh, and yet, uh, Stan didn't even bother to... Uh, to mention it, and yet, you know, uh, you know, he mentioned Ant Man. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I, I, was, I got quite a kick out of uh, out of seeing something like that because I was thinking, well, did I just imagine it that Stan Lee had said that Ant Man was coming out, but not Spider Man? And then finally, it was, the, uh, it was this postcard. But you know, this book is not as is not all about uh, Marvel, of course. I mean, naturally, Stan has been so associated with with Marvel that the that uh, most of it will will be about Marvel, but of course Stan did you know a number of other things. Uh, in, some of them from magazine management, the same company, but they weren't comics and occasional other uh, other companies and so forth. So it, it's really trying to get a kind of a, a nice cross section of what Stanley is all about. Naturally, Marvel will be will loom very large in there because that's what he's most known for. But we tried to touch on 
other bases, including, as Danny said earlier, uh, personal things and all sorts of other projects he had. I mean, you know, there are so many projects that aren't documented. For example, I once worked with him on a, a an outline, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 pages at least. Back, This would have been back at no later than, I don't know, the early 70s or something, maybe late 60s, early 70s, for a Buck Rogers movie, you know, years before he was back on television. Stan, and I just remember Stan gave me a few sentences of, of uh, what uh, he had in mind, which involved the pollution and a, a big dome over a city and in a, in a, a, a different future, which didn't owe much to the old original comic strip, and uh, any more than the later TV series did. And then I took it and expanded it, and then Stan took that and threw away most of what I had and <laughs> rewrote it himself. <laughs> Nothing ever got done, but I, was, I wish that had turned out. But, you know, there's always room for a volume, too, right, Danny? Uh, you know, we've uh, had a lot of requests for it, and there are in Stan's archive 90 boxes of material, so we only scratched the surface uh, uh, with this book. I, I, I found the most, uh, to historians and comic fans, I think that debate with Hilda Mossy is, might be the most surprising and interesting find. Where Yeah, I should have mentioned that, too. That was great. With Barry yeah, Farber. Uh, uh, hmm? With Barry Farber. With Bar- on the Barry Farber show. Right. And, you know, she had worked closely with Wortham, and, uh, and, and and similarly to Wortham, it was really more of a, uh, you know, liberal uh, progressive uh, in her politics and, and her opinions, but believed comic books and popular culture uh, were pernicious. And so she has, um, although she herself is, is, was a uh, refugee from the Nazis and had, her family had all everything taken from them, she has this thick German accent, so it's Stan debating this uh, this passionate uh, woman who hates comics, and so she's very adamant. And uh, for her, it still may as well be 1954, not not 1968. And Stan just says, "Now listen, Doc. You know he's very he can just talk to anybody in any circumstance." And uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's funny yet deadly serious at the same at the same time. And uh, uh, there's other stuff um, I found uh, in the archives um, correspondence between Stan and the Country Joe and the Fish organization because the fish had come to visit Marvel thanks to Gary Friedrich in the 60s and so Stan writes them a letter addressing them as dear piscatorial pals right, that was and, great. And, then, and then through the magic of the internet I found a couple of the uh, members of the band who reminisced about who, and we have them in here they're uh, in, reminiscing about um, uh, going to visit uh, a Stan at Marvel and, and also as I mentioned that there's a Eisner correspondence for a project that never happened, and also a project that um, uh, uh, Roy, what, what, what's um, Rich Corbin? Uh, uh, Rich Corbin, okay. yeah. R- Richard Corbin had a proposal for a magazine uh, that he wanted to do for Marvel. That was very radical for the time, and this correspondence of again back and forth between him and Stan, and you sort of see. Um, you know, for every project that gets greenlighted at a publishing company, there's a uh, you know a, a hundred that don't. So this is I perfectly. I was around for at the time of many of these little projects that didn't get started. But it's interesting uh, because when Danny uh, dug these up at the uh, at the at Stan's archives, uh, I wasn't really familiar enough with familiar with many of them because. Stan didn't bother to tell me about them unless there was some reason for me to know. He wanted me to you know keep working away on the books and so forth, as opposed to uh, getting distracted if, at some stage or other. If he if he'd, uh, worked out a deal with Carbon, maybe I and, or whoever was the editor at the time would have been involved. But up through 74, uh, you know, he told me whenever I needed to know and, and wouldn't otherwise. For example, the only, you know, I never knew much about the thing with Will Eisner until suddenly Stan told me, uh, you got to go out with uh, to lunch with Will Eisner. Well, you know, don't throw me in that uh, wire patch, you know. And uh, talk to, but the, the unpleasant side was, you know, I had to talk to him about some of the things on, uh, you know, that uh, Stan wanted to do on this uh, this book and so forth. And yet, I didn't really know what Stan wanted to do on the book, so I was kind of tossed in there to, to try to come up with a plan for a a parody book that was somewhere between uh, what Mad and the National Lampoon, and uh, you know, and that that became you know very interesting. And uh, somehow, Eisner and uh, Stan perhaps were not on the same page there, you know, they, they, so, I, so I don't, so it, it didn't come to anything, it's probably just as well if it didn't, I, I don't think it would have been a, a marriage, uh, I have a feeling that, that, that you know, that Eisner, uh, if, if Eisner had become Stan's 
editor in chief too. I'm not sure that they wouldn't have clashed pretty soon. Both of them were pretty pretty used to being independent and getting their own way. You know? and, and Eisner really, uh, you know, really had no interest in superheroes. That was not his. You know, I mean, despite the, the series being nominally a superhero, he he never really uh, felt an, an affinity for the genre. You know, um, but but interestingly enough, and as we document in the book, that same year, there's a crazy magazine came out with articles and features by Will Eisner. You know, so uh, somewhere um, uh, Marvel and uh, and and you, Roy, and Stan and Will came to um, some kind of. Uh, Understanding. I mean, they were they were they were good friends, uh, as far as I know. Oh yeah. So it, um, well, the stuff in the stuff in Crazy from Will was picked up from one of his uh, books, I think. I don't think he did any original work for it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it was that picked up. Be. I think it was picked up from the book. And the thing about that uh, the humor magazine, as I recall, I think Roy, you had put me on. Uh, it's been a while, and I didn't look this up. I think you had put me on to Marv Wolfman, and, and someone else who. Um, went and spent time with Will. Will was still doing PS Magazine, the Army Magazine, and they were talking about kind of a counter-cultural uh, humor magazine and making the point to him, you know, you're as establishment as there can be. You do a comic book for the Army, for God's sakes. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I think that was one of the uh, the nails in that coffin. Um, l- let me ask you guys, though, uh, and Roy, you mentioned this a minute ago, that uh, Stan obviously did a lot of things uh, besides Marvel well, and later, but none of the um, none of the things he created and took on, and you have a lot of them documented at the end here, nothing ever equaled the success of a single character at Marvel, and I wondered why you guys thought that might be. Uh, you know, if we, if uh, I'll speak for myself, if I knew, if I knew how to do that, I, I'd do it every week. I mean, you're talking about capturing lightning in a bottle. Right. Why you know, why does one character or set of creators uh, or method of storytelling suddenly, you know, grab on for for a certain period and and then uh, you know and then and then and then allegedly isn't equaled? Although you know, you could you know one could one could argue with that. But say if we take that as you know, how many times in your life can you create Spider Man? How many times in your life can you create the Fantastic Four? You know. Well. Uh, the thing is that uh, not just not only the person has to be the right person, Stan, but in, in his case, since he was an editor and a writer, he also had to have just the right combination of artists to come around. And as luck, as much as you know, to some extent it was luck, but of course he's the person who hired them too. Uh, he had in Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, two of the very best artists to help realize that vision. Jack Kirby, who had been a giant. Uh, for many years in the field, and Steve Ditko, who was certainly not a giant in the field, even though, you know, he had been in the field for years and doing some fine work, but uh, nobody had ever particularly, you know, noticed that uh, they have DC or the other, you know, companies. But he, but they happen to be just the right people to, um, and the other, uh, to uh, be his collaborators, uh, and the time has to be right, uh, you know, you think of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who created Superman, and you know, about a decade later, they uh, they tried to create Funny Man, uh, you know, to uh, be sort of the anti-superhero, the clown of the superhero, and that went, you know, absolutely nowhere, even though they said, from the creators of Superman and so forth. You know, sometimes uh, things just work out right one time. In Stan's case, you could say they either worked out one time with Marvel Comics, or you could say they worked out, what, a half a dozen or a dozen times with the major characters that he and Jack and... Steve and a handful of other people, including Don Heck on Iron Man, et cetera, created. And you know, I mean, the, you know, one you know one of the amazing things about Stan is that uh, this month he turns what eighty nine uh, on the twenty eighth, and uh, he is still there's like ten press releases a week uh, from Pow Entertainment about new properties Stan is coming up with. Now, will one of them be the next Spider Man? Uh, you know, who knows. But, it's, you know, he's still in there literally pitching and giving it his all. So, I mean, he's, who, you know, who knows what combination of forces. I mean, when you're a creative person, you sort of have to keep going through your, you know, your, your, what, your, uh, what people may think of as, you know, as, as, as uh, your greatest triumph. And then 
And then, uh, but you know, when they created Spider Man, they, as as, as uh, Roy said, they it was a throwaway. They didn't know they were they were capturing that lightning in a bottle. You just you keep doing it, and uh, sometimes things uh, strike a nerve, and and, and sometimes uh, uh, they other, don't. Stan's other things must you know make a, some of them at least must be making money for somebody. They wouldn't keep coming back to him as they have over the last decade or two decades since he's been not quite exclusive with you know Marvel. Uh, they wouldn't keep coming back to him if, if none of these things were making any money. The word gets around pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, after, sure. after Funny Man, like Siegel and Schuster, you know, no uh, people were coming running to them and saying, okay, well, let's give it another shot. With Stan, some of these things are making money. Just, no, nothing's ever been quite as big as Marvel Comics. There he had this entire company behind him at the time, the artist, and everything was just right. But uh, he keeps coming out with, with things. Some things uh, are more popular than others, and... Uh, so somebody, everybody's saying, well, you know, maybe the next one, you know, will be, and who knows who we to say it won't be. You know, he's, he's only 89 or 88. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually was curious to see if you guys would say that the, uh, the the difference really between then and now is is the culture of, of the, uh, the corporate culture, actually, which, you know, was Stan, I guess, for the most part. But uh, it's different, you know, being out on your own. Although I have to say, I, and I... I think that of all the things that he's done outside of Marvel, the thing that I've enjoyed the most and and and, and I thought endured in some ways, you may not you guys may not agree, was actually the TV show he did for Sci-Fi. Uh, I thought that that captured for a lot of people the essence of some of the fun of the the whole superhero thing. Who wants to be a superhero? And that's just me, but um, I it think was, well, it, it was it was so dominated by Stan's personality. You know, right. it was part. I mean, part of Marvel's success and his success is that ability to convey that this sense of fun and the sense that you're in on something special, you know. And 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 that show, I think, uh, was another iteration of that. I think that was yeah, more special. Saying, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Roy. I keep running into people who really loved it. I remember I was on the uh, the Library Society of the uh, University of South Carolina at the time here, and uh, you know, and there were people there just crazy for me to get. You know Stan Lee. Of course, they they knew him from the comics, but mostly said, "Oh yeah, I just just my kids. They just love his TV show." You know, and <laughs> you know, to him, he was like a new discovery. They didn't know who Stan was. I mean, how many people? You know, they, people have only read his comics mostly in reprints nowadays. But uh, here he was, this guy talking to them on television. Well, I had another, uh, yeah, yeah, I had thing, one, uh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Danny. I'm sorry. Now, one, you know, one thing we sort of document in the book is Stan's role. Not you know, you know, as if it wasn't enough that he was you know editor, art director and uh, chief writer at Marvel, he then went out and, uh, you know, created that sense of community of Marvel itself, and even poking fun at, you know, at the brand F, you know, even that created the sense of a larger comics world, and certainly he promoted himself, but he was promoting Marvel and promoting the comics medium. He's probably the greatest cheerleader the medium of comics ever had, you know, so he, his influence is felt in that, and I think his influence is really felt I think you can't watch a current action movie or action TV show without basically seeing the these the structures of storytelling that he and his collaborators establish at Marvel. The way a story builds, the different subplots, uh, the different mysteries, the romance, everything. Kind of, uh, I think I think there's like a whole uh, several generations of of popular storytelling that essentially are Marvel comic comics. I, I think of Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a prime example. It may, that may as well have been a Stan Lee, Jack Kirby Marvel comic. Hmm. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can find uh, Roy Thomas and Danny Fingeroth's really wonderful new collection of memorabilia, anecdotes, and interviews, The Stan Lee Universe, in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. Uh, guys, uh, either of you ha- or both of you have uh, a, a website, either individually or for the book or Twitter, Facebook, anything like that you want to share with folks? Um, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter and Facebook, and I've just dipped my toe. Uh, DannyFingeroth.com does finally exist, although right now it's a page that says, Hi, everybody, DannyFingeroth.com exists. Hey, by the Stanley Universe, but it, it, the the website will be expanding. I'm 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 on my way into the 90s. And Roy? Yeah, I, I'm still learning learning how to turn on my fax machine. So don't get <laughs> like that. You know, I, uh, anything that I uh, want to say or deal with, uh, you know, I deal with on pretty much on the uh, printed page with uh, Alter Ego, which is you know an eight times a year magazine of comics history, primarily about the period from the 
the late 30s and 40s through about the uh, mid 70s, um, and uh, so, so that that gives me an outlet for that. Other than that, I just you know I, I just write a few emails and try to keep my head down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I'll I'll remind everyone that you can also uh, you can see. Uh, uh, Danny Fingeroth live and in the flesh frequently at the, the Museum of Comic and Comic Art. Comic yeah. and Cartoon Art. Comic and Cartoon Art. I knew I was yes. saying it wrong, and I just couldn't Correct. get it in my head. Thank you for correcting I'm, that. I'm, I'm not sure when this is when this is airing, but on Thursday, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night, I'm moderating a uh, panel with Jules Pfeiffer and Erwin Hazen. Uh, so if you're in the New York area, it's seven bucks, free for Mocha members. Uh, uh, you can't beat it. All right. Wish that we're going to be there. <laughs> me too. You, can, you well, can catch me if you buy by buying the DVD of the uh, the new Conan the Barbarian movie, where they interviewed me about the uh, the comics for one of the the, the extra features. Oh, very cool. That's as close as I get to a live appearance. All right. Well, listen, <laughs> on, uh, on the media. Roy Thomas, Danny Fingerroth, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us at Mr. Media today. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, guys. Be well. Bye bye. Take care. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea? Download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. And you can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Hey, this is comedian Mark Marin, and I love Mr. Media Radio, even though he didn't let me go on as long as some other guests. Hey, folks. You can hear Mr. Media while on the go now with Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile app available for your smartphone, whether you use an iPhone, iPod Touch, Android, Blackberry Curve, or Palm Pre. And when you download Stitcher to hear Mr. Media today, you have a chance to win some real money. Downloading is quick and easy. Just find Stitcher in your smartphone's app store. Download it. It's free. Take seconds. Then, during registration, hit the promo code box and enter Mr. Media, that's MR Media, to get automatically entered to win $100. The latest episode of Mr. Media will be waiting for you in Stitcher's Favorites right on your phone. You'll get access to lots of other amazing shows, too, always available to you on demand, no syncing. Some of my favorites include WTF with Mark Marin, Plus One Per Diem with Kevin Smith, and The Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. It's all free and all instant to you on Stitcher Smart Radio. And don't forget to win the money. Enter promo code Mr. Media, MR Media, when you register. And thanks for listening.